Please welcome Willie Jackson. Folks, let's be honest, that's a very big picture of my face. Let's move on quickly. I heard somebody say my name. That's fabulous. This is a great start. Hi. Hello, person I know. Um, <clears throat> I think it's my neighbor. Hey, neighbor. Um, let's get right into it. I want to talk today about this ally skills framework. My colleague and I, shout out to Dr. Kim Tran and the mighty, mighty Ready Set team. Um, my colleague and I co-created this framework about a year ago. And I've probably done this workshop about 50 times over the intervening months. And I've been so inspired and touched by the response. And so today, I want to walk you through what this framework entails and what we might take away from it. So I sometimes introduce myself as a professional African American. It's great work if you can get it, truly. And, and don't let anybody <laughs> tell you otherwise. It's, it's exceptional <clears throat> from my vantage point. And it's a joke, of course, but it's a joke with purpose and with intention. You see, I deal with topics of diversity, equity, and inclusion for a living, topics across differences. Um, by a show of hands, how many of you have had a conversation about race or gender that did not go well? Yeah, <laughs> I see a lot of hands shooting up. Um, yeah, it can be challenging, right? And that causes us to maybe shrink into ourselves, maybe feel a little bit smaller, maybe feel like we're not going to do that again next time. And so the reason I use humor in my work is to make these topics more accessible. Not to make light of situations, but to remind ourselves that we need to breathe, and sometimes it's OK to laugh, right? And so the invitation is to move from the notion of being an ally to being an accomplice. And what the research shows is that words like diversity, equity, inclusion, allyship, belonging, and so forth mean different things to different people based on the bodies we're born into and the contexts in which we were socialized. Or as I say, if you walk into any black barbershop or salon in the nation, nobody is earnestly debating the merits of diversity and inclusion. That's not how humans talk, right? These are euphemisms. And there are limitations with this language, right? And so I think it's really helpful to talk about what we mean when we say certain words and to get at the what uh, is behind the words that we say and what we mean. And so if the invitation is to move from the notion of being an ally or allyship to being an accomplice, let's talk a little bit about what allyship means. And so allyship is a lifelong process of building relationships based on trust, consistency, and accountability with marginalized individuals and or groups of people. We could spend the workshop talking about these words alone, right? Trust, consistency, and accountability. Friends, we don't need fair weather allies. We don't need people to be allies when it's convenient for them or only when it's on the agenda. We need people who are willing to put their shoulder to the wheel when it's inconvenient, when we didn't plan for it, and when it might cost us something, right? And that brings us to the notion of being an accomplice, right? And so an accomplice is rooted, the word is rooted in indigenous rights movements, and it really underscores the fact that this work might cost you something. It might be your social spending, it might be your comfort, it might be your reputation, um, and it might not be easy. And that's what we need. We need people willing to do something with their power, their privilege, and their access. I had somebody in a workshop recently say, I like the term accomplice because it feels like I'm about to do something bad. I said, yes, and I'm not bailing you out of jail. <laughs> Choose wisely. Um, and so when we talk about what this means in practice, we need to think about what, um, what the stakes are of allyship and what we have to offer for this conversation. I think this work begins with an honest self-assessment and a look in the mirror. What do we have to offer? And specifically, what are our blind spots? The research shows that our neighborhoods now are more segregated than they were in the 50s. Right? We don't live in community with each other. We don't live connected to each other in the way that we really desperately need to. And right, so what are, our, what are our blind spots? What are our cultural and societal blind spots? And what are our growth areas on the basis of those blind spots? These are questions that we have to answer for ourselves, and we can't get these answers from other people. We have to let our discomfort and our blind spots guide the way for us. Right? Our neighborhoods now are deeply segregated, and we don't live in communities with each other, in community with each other. And what this means in practice is that your work is going to look different from somebody else's. You can't just sit on the front row of a workshop and say, tell me everything that I need to know so I don't embarrass myself, right? So I don't step in it, right? So I don't accidentally make a mistake and get dragged on Twitter. That's not how this works. Your work is going to look different from somebody else's. 
I firmly believe that there's work for all of us to do based on who we are, our privilege, our access, and our opportunities, right? So I didn't choose to be born into this tall, chocolatey frame. <laughs> it works for me. I'll take it. Um, but I didn't choose it. And what it means is that there are privileges and there are benefits afforded to me through no choice of my own, right? I don't get talked over in meetings. And so it's really easy for me to redirect attention towards a colleague who might be getting talked over, right? Kim, were you finished? Simple things like that that make the work of being an ally or an accomplice even more accessible. I was walking a colleague from one building to another to her next meeting uh, a few months ago in New York City, and she was practically skipping down the street, and she said, no street harassment today. That was humbling, deeply, deeply humbling, because I don't think about that. That's a blind spot for me. I don't have the same physical safety concerns as many women, right? It's just something I don't think about. Um, I don't have to strategize paths to the subway after I get out of an event late at night. I don't have to look over my shoulder when I'm walking to a car or through a dimly lit area, right? That's just not something I think about. Or as I say, nobody's throwing Willie Jackson in the back of a van because that would be a bad day for everyone. <laughs> and I firmly believe as well that we all have a story to tell. And we live in a current political environment that says that if you're not a visible minority, right, if you don't have obvious moral claim to having a voice in this conversation about difference, about oppression, about identity, about inequality, then you can't take up space. I don't think we can get to where we need to go if that is our frame, if that is our litmus test, if you have to look like somebody who has been oppressed, then you can't talk. I don't think that frame will get us to where we need to go. I'm willing to believe, regardless of what you look like, if you come from a majority group, you come from wealth and status and privilege, I'm willing to believe that you've overcome a lot in your life. And there might be people in your past, your antecedents, your ancestors, who overcame a tremendous amount of oppression and setbacks in order for you to have the opportunities that you have. And so I think our stories are vital as a way to build bridges towards connection, as a way of unlocking our humanity and understanding this shared experience of humanity that we all have. What I'm not saying is that you should take over conversations and inject your stories into them and, and ignore other people. What I'm saying is that you should make space for yourself, for your stories, and invite those stories into your way of being in the world. I want to leave you with a simple charge. So you've all seen these research, the research about how if you put two identical resumes into the world, one by John Smith and the other by Shakisha Jenkins, John is getting 80% of the callbacks, right? You're familiar with this work. When you look a little bit more deeply at why this happens, it's not just because people have these deeply ingrained prejudicial beliefs. It's because people are anticipating the discriminatory beliefs of their colleagues, and they're doing the discrimination for them. Folks, that sounds like an opportunity to me. When, the, when you have moments where you feel like you want to respond to fear and being small and discriminating or just thinking less bravely than you could, I invite you to stand strong, plant your feet, and do something bad. Maybe be an accomplice. Thank you so much.